from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James H. Billington, the Librarian of Congress. Dr. Billington? It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to the nation's oldest cultural, national cultural institution. And um, John Cole, who runs our Center for the Book, uh, and its na nationwide branches of the center. We'll talk, talk about the collaboration uh, with the Hirshhorn, Mr. Kashalik, and so forth. So he will talk about that, and I'll, I'll get out of the way very quickly, but I did want to say just one word since you're in the Jefferson Building and you're going to be talking, uh, our distinguished speaker today is going to be talking about public space and, and architecture and sound and these interaction of all these elements and the Library of Congress is itself an interaction but I thought just a word about the building which you're in which you're probably familiar with but um, it is uh, uh, a rather astonishing um, architectural accomplishment itself uh, when it was completed between 1886 and 1897 it was pronounced the largest, the costliest, and the safest library in the world. And it's still to this day, it was restored by the Congress in the late 20th century. We, um, it is really, uh, it has been decorated by 40 major artists who are brought here. It's uh, sustained this unique position and now has many, many more public visitors as well as users of the incredible main reading room. And so it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here and have such a distinguished speaker to mind. I could just might mention that we've just finished celebrating at the library and up in Vermont the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act. Justin Morrill was the man who put through in his lifetime, not just created the land-grant universities, um, and the whole uh, A&M's state university system in America, which was so many, many decades and years ahead of the rest of the world in opening up higher education to everybody. But he also pushed the uh, appropriation through the, through the Congress, and he died one year later. He was the longest serving congressman uh, up until the second half of the 20th century. In the, in the history of the Congress, even though he only entered, he had only a primary education, but building this building was his pride and joy. He, he, uh, he brought um, uh, the uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, the head of Central Park, the man who created that in New York, down to, to really design it as part of a whole transforming architectural and landscape uh, transformation of Washington at the end of the the 19th century, and all of that wasn't enacted, but this building, he did live, he died one year later, having played a major role to give the Library of Congress its first home, which is now reconnected with a passageway from, from the Congress, and, so that, and from the uh, Congressional Visitor Center, so it's greatly increased in its public usage, and we're particularly honored to have Victoria Newhouse, and I just have to say one word, because my brother, who's writing a long, uh, basically a trilogy, on how engineering transformed American history. No world-class engineer has ever done this, how it built America in many ways. Another of the great accomplishments of our own country. And uh, his editor uh, was uh, Victoria Newhouse. So we're really honored. Uh, I personally uh, feel a familial bond of gratitude for such a wonderful editor, and I think we all feel gratitude that she's been such a powerful force uh, in not only uh, editing, but in writing her own works, and particularly illuminating the way the arts, the visual arts, and the literary arts interact 
uh, which is something that happens in these collections, and of course, in the Hirshhorn and the great complex to which it belongs. So let me turn this floor back to John and to our friends from the Hirshhorn who will do the introduction of our magnificent speaker today. Thank you, Dr. Billington. The Center for the Book, which I had, was created to promote books and reading, and it uh, also has affiliates around the country in this effort that we have to try to also increase literacy around the world. Uh, we are very pleased to have a partnership with the Hish Hish Hirshhorn, uh, which started uh, once uh, uh, Richard Kocholik came to share together the world of books and the world of design in ways that we haven't quite developed fully. In part, we sponsor uh, talks about artistic subjects, but in part, we're also involving each other's institutions in new ways. For example, there's a poetry and literature center at the Library of Congress that is now talking with the Hirshhorn about uh, ways that we can do interviews between uh, poets and uh, artists in ways that haven't been developed. Uh, we have a wonderful prints and photographs division at the Library of Congress that the Center for the Book hasn't worked with so much until the Hirshhorn came along. And it helped us make some links and we're continuing to talk about some potential projects. So it's a special pleasure for me to uh, be able to uh, get this program started by introducing our guests. Uh, first, I'd like to say something about uh, today's conversation. We have been fortunate because the Library of Congress does uh, video the programs of the Center for the Book and all of the Library of Congress. And today's program is being taped for later viewing on our website, as are, I must add, because it's September and we're about to host the next National Book Festival at the Library of Congress, all of the author talks at the book festival since the beginning have been uh, videotaped and are available on the Library of Congress website. So this is yet another form of educational outreach uh, that we're pleased that we can uh, help with and I think is important for uh, our country. Uh, today we will have a conversation which will also include a question and answer session and uh, for those of you who have not purchased the beautiful book, which will be discussed today, uh, we do have it on sale in the back for signing at a very special Library of Congress staff discount price. So I hope that that appeals to some of you. Uh, because we are filming, we ask that you uh, turn off all things electronic. Uh, secondly, we once we have the question and answer period, uh, I have to say that uh, if you do ask a question from the floor, and this is not to discourage you, uh, you will probably become a member of the uh, website conversation for the Library of Congress, and thank you in advance for your permission. Uh, I would now like to uh, turn the program uh, over to Richard. Uh, Richard uh, came to the Hirshhorn in 2009 after a long and distinguished career uh, as the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Uh, he also, I learned today, uh, has been at other museums such as the one in Fort Worth, but in particular he reminded me that the relevance of his uh, not only friendship with Victoria, but something that brings them together is that he chaired the design and architectural committee for Disney Hall. And I said, does that mean you hired Frank Gehry? And he sort of said yes. Uh, but this will be part of, I think, the conversation uh, that he and uh, Victoria will be holding. Uh, Richard, I want to thank you in advance also for uh, arranging for this partnership between the Library of Congress and the Hirshhorn, or at least urging it forward and having a little help on the arrangement side. Uh, his colleague Erica Clark is here, who also is working with me to expand this partnership. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to turn the program over to Richard uh, to get us started for the conversation. Let's give Richard a hand. Richard. Thank you, sir. You're the best. You're the best. You're 
master at this. Good morning, or is it good? Yeah, it's good morning, isn't it? It's still good morning. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Richard Kashalik, uh, and I've had a long engagement with architecture, uh, going back to college where I studied architecture and architecture design. Uh, and so uh, today's guest, uh, but before I get there, I'd like to thank Dr. James Billington. This is somebody that not only do I admire, but the whole country admires. And for 25 years, he's been the Librarian of Congress. And that's probably one of the most distinguished positions you can hold uh, in our country. And he has done an extraordinary job. And uh, one of the subjects that is of great interest to both of us is this idea, which I won't talk about in any detail, the World Library, which he's working with libraries all over the world to create something that is going to be critical to how we learn in the future, how we study in the future, and so on. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. John Cole, who has been nothing but a great spirit with regard to this program, which is just starting. This is the fourth in a series of programs, and it's going to continue to expand, as he mentioned. And to Erica Clark, who represents uh, the Hirshhorn Museum uh, and is working with us on this program to continue to build this interrelationship between this great institution uh, the Library of Congress and the Hirshhorn, which deals with contemporary issues of culture and so on. So uh, uh, that is extremely important to me that we have that collaboration. Uh, today, I, the, what we're welcoming you to is a conversation with somebody who I've known for a considerable period of time. I have fond memories of having dinner or lunch on the beach with David Geffen and Tom Hanks and your husband and yourself after we saw a movie uh, and in on Malibu, but uh, we've had contact having to do with the art world, having to do with the world of architecture and, and so on, and she's somebody I admire greatly, greatly, and what she's accomplished and what she's going to continue to accomplish in the future is nothing short of brilliant, brilliant. And so we're very lucky to have her here today, and uh, we'll just move to the next slide. Oh, I've got it here. Okay. This will take not long. Oh, there it is. I'll go back. There it is. I'm going to introduce her by just showing two or three of the recent books that she's done. We all know that she started the Architecture Historic Hist History Foundation, produced over 25 or more major, major scholarly texts uh, that have redefined the history of architecture. But uh, in, two th in 1998, she did a book co called Towards a New Museum. And the New York Times uh, book review said, reading through these pages, is to be engaged in a provocative conversation with passionate, very intelligent people. Uh, and that was the book that was done in 1998. Another book which really had a great influence, uh, Art and Power of Placement, uh, was done in 2005, again with Monticelli Press. Uh, and it was written in the Journal of Aesthetics and Art Criticism, very distinguished publication, that every now and then someone has the genius to take what seems a rather obvious idea and transform it into a major revelation. Victoria Newhouse has done just that by probing in depth the familiar observation that the way a picture is hung can enhance or diminish its effect. And this book had a great influence on a lot of people because I think the quality of architecture in museums and the quality of the work of art, there are equal signs between them. You can put a great Rembrandt in an average building and you'll diminish the Rembrandt. You can put a weak or not a significant painting in a great work of architecture and it will diminish the building. And there are these equal signs. And so that was one of the very important pathfinding books that we did. Today we're going to talk about this book, Sight and Sound. Uh, and uh, the Ada Louise Huxtable, probably the greatest critic of all when it comes to architecture, uh, wrote in the Wall Street Journal, uh, she understands the nature and necessity of social, technological, architectural change. She goes beyond conventional architectural criticism, very important, I think, and deals with acoustical analysis to, out, <coughs> to outspoken criticism of the re, to, to the re, uh, results. And she has come to some surprising conclusions, which you're going to hear today in her 25-minute presentation that is going to be global in its scope. So I, it is a, with great pleasure I'm going to introduce her. But before I do, uh, John mentioned that I chaired the Architecture Selection Committee for Disney Hall. 
And when we were doing the research for this, inst for this building, which I think is the greatest building built in Los Angeles ever, uh, we traveled around the world with members of the, of the orchestra, the LA Philharmonic Orchestra. With, uh, we traveled with the, no architects, because we hadn't chosen the architect yet, but also with members of the Disney family and so on. Uh, and every time we had a meeting anywhere in the world, when we visited the concert hall, and it might have been Pierre Boulez, it might have been Isaac Stern, it could have been Daniel Berenboom, I asked him only one question. When you play in a great work of architecture, when you play in a great hall, I said, does the quality, quality of your performance go up? And without any hesitation, but in very different ways, every single one of them, and there were really maybe 25 to 50 interviews like this, said, when we play in a great hall, the quality of our perform uh, performance goes up. And we're inspired by the building. And we took that to <clears throat> the head of the, the board of the Music Center and said, because of this, because of this, uh, the important thing is that we build in Los Angeles a work of art. It's got to be like a Stradivarius. It's got to be a great work of art because we think the audience in Los Angeles deserves the greatest performances by the greatest artists and the greatest composers from around the world. Uh, and so we had that involvement, and this is the hall of it, uh, the inside of it, but it is my great pleasure, really, truly great pleasure, to introduce to you Victoria Newhouse. Well, I hope I can live up to these flattering introductions. Thank you very much, Dr. Billington, Mr. Cole, and uh, Richard Kashalik. Uh, let's see now. I have to be sure that my slides are, there we go. I think we're starting with that. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you all for coming this afternoon uh, to talk about the relationship between architecture and music. And I think it's a very interesting relationship and rather unusual in the history of architecture because in fact, for hundreds of years, the horseshoe for opera and the shoebox for concerts have remained the same, uh, totally almost totally unvaried since the two genres began. Opera in the mid 17th century and uh, uh, concert shortly thereafter. On the screen, you see the Palais Garnier in Paris, with, which is an excellent example that would be great, uh, of, the, uh, of the horseshoe. Uh, and on the right, the Musikverein in Vienna, a very good example of the shoebox, a rectangular uh, space. Both of them were completed in the last quarter of the 19th century. The reason that architects have been so reluctant to change these, these shapes is for fear of compromising the acoustic quality of the spaces. Uh, and acoustics are the ultimate criterion, of course, of their success. Rebecca Robertson, the directory of the Armory uh, in Manhattan, says when you design an artistic, uh, when you design a performance space, you design the artistic experience before it takes place. This is applicable to historic venues and to many of the new palaces for the arts. This is the spectacular Oslo Opera House designed by the Norwegian firm of Snoeta with the brilliant uh, design of the roof coming right down to ground level uh, so that it has become a promenade. In fact, one of the favorite promenades in this city. The Dallas Opera House by Norman Foster is the latest addition to a large cu cultural center that was inaugurated in 1984 with a fine arts museum by Edward Larrabee Barnes. It too has a very traditional uh, interior, as does the Oslo Opera House, that's why I didn't show the interior, uh, uh, a horseshoe. Uh, it has this unusual detail uh, of continuing the top tier balcony without seats, of course, uh, 
across the proscenium, which reduces the feeling of the size of the space and makes it more friendly. In Portugal, Rem Koolhaas's Casa de Musica, finished in 2005, is, as you can see, an unusual irregular shape, just as his Seattle library was uh, equally unusual. Somewhat forbidding, but with windows uh, around the ground level that allow uh, the public to look in and to actually see some of the activities taking place uh, inside. Once inside, the interior becomes much more friendly with a twisting staircase uh, winding through the building with the views from one part of the interior to another and finally coming to the main auditorium. Corrugated glass walls at both uh, ends, uh, and here is one covered by a curtain, unfortunately, uh, are one of many new materials being developed uh, that, are, that are actually uh, promoting good acoustics. A sa soft plastic cushion uh, hanging above the stage uh, replaces the usual canopy, and the plywood grain uh, is embossed with gold leaf. That's a little hard to see uh, on this slide, but uh, in fact, it's, it's a very warm uh, feeling, a very nice feeling. And together with the absence of a proscenium and the narrowness of the hall, it makes for a very alluring space. Initial problems with the acoustics that were not reverberant enough uh, are, have, have, I think, by now been worked out. Jean Nouvel's building for the Danish Broadcasting uh, Corporation in Copenhagen is a glass-walled building covered in this glass fiber mesh on which uh, images are projected uh, at night, images all related somehow to music. Uh, needless to say, the building is more interesting at night than in the daytime. And it's very, very beautiful concert hall in a, what is called a vineyard configuration uh, with the performers at the middle of the hall and the audience arranged around, much as you would have in a theater in the ra round. This configuration was introduced in 1963 in Germany by Hans Scharoun for the Berlin Philharmonie. Uh, and the idea was in a divided city, a city that had been divided for so many years politically, uh, this would imply, sort of uh, symbolize uh, a coming together of people because it certainly does create a more intimate uh, feeling. Uh, and I would call intimacy the buzzword of theater design today. As museums are doing for the visual arts, there is an effort to make the performing arts more participatory. With this kind of seating arrangement, people are looking at each other instead of at the backs of heads. And also, it allows more people to be closer to the musicians. This is a very typical image for China today with this absolutely huge new town rising uh, at the outskirts of a very old city, Guangzhou, uh, the former Canton. Here, you might miss it, easily miss it, because it's so overshadowed by the newer buildings, uh, is an opera house, an all-purpose theater designed by Zaha Hadid. The interior is particularly interesting because Hadid dared to change the horseshoe slightly by making it slightly asymmetrical. As you can see, this little segment breaks the symmetry of the horseshoe arrangement. Now, these beautiful new buildings are facing some serious challenges. Oslo is doing OK with performances practically every day of the year, Dallas had to cut way back on a very ambitious opera schedule that they simply did not find an audience for. 
Copenhagen is struggling uh, with the theater dark uh, two thirds of the year. And uh, Guangzhou has been dark, I'm told, for 300 days of its first year. Just to look for a moment at some of the other challenges, uh, construction uh, is not easy for this kind of building. This is the Elbe Philharmonie by Herzog and de Moran in Hamburg. Uh, it's a computer rendering. Uh, the addition is what they call the crystal, uh, an all glass enclosed volume on top of a 1940s warehouse. It was announced in 2007 uh, for completion in 2010. Uh, it is a very complicated uh, structure. Uh, in addition to a concert hall, it will have a hotel, luxury apartments, restaurants, and other attractions. At the time it was announced, the estimate for it was $265.5 million. Today, that estimate has risen to $620.5 million, and it has become something of a political issue uh, in Hamburg uh, because of this uh, extraordinary escalation in costs and the difficulty in constructing the building, which <clears throat> in fact has stopped construction at the moment. I'd like to add that these problems seem to be unrelated to the global recession, uh, as the rest of this huge harbor development has been up until now quite successful. This is what the interior uh, will look like if this building ever gets built. Peter Eisenman's cultural complex in Santiago de Compostela seems to be counting on the annual influx of 12 million pilgrims because the town itself has a population of only 90,000 uh, for a cultural center that is going to be bigger than the Getty Center in Los Angeles. This too was announced with uh, an estimate of three years for construction. The estimate in 1999 at the time of the announcement was $146 uh, million. And when, it, 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 when it's completed, uh, the thinking is that it will have cost uh, about $600 million. Uh, another uh, daunting statistic for this particular complex uh, is that it's going to cost $80 million a year to run in a community that is not a, a wealthy community. Uh, ground was broken in 2001, and now only four of the planned buildings uh, are completed. He, two here, two here, and this hole in the middle is where the opera house and another museum uh, are planned. The Cidade de Musica uh, on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro is another cultural center in serious difficulty with construction just about halted uh, because of the escalation in costs and the difficulty in building it. It has the misfortune to be placed at the intersection of two extremely busy highways, so I can't help wondering uh, how people are actually going to access the, uh, the cultural center. Uh, its thin concrete forms between horizontal planes recall Niemeyer, and if you can see here, it's rather small, but uh, in this section, uh, there are towers, in fact, eight movable towers uh, that can transform the concert hall into an opera house. Rem Koolhaas says of these new cultural palaces that the demands and expectations for them are so excessive, have become so excessive, that they are very, very hard to pull off. However, I would just like to remind uh, you of one fact, which is that the Palais Garnier uh, took 12 years to build, and in fact, many people wanted to abandon it uh, in, min in midstream because the difficulties were considered uh, nearly 
insurmountable. There is, however, a parallel universe uh, around the world of alternative spaces. This is the Poisson Rouge uh, in Manhattan, a cabaret with varied programming. It's informal, flexible, Tickets to performances there are much less expensive than they would be in a normal theater. And it's a very nice example of a, a small alternative space. Like other alternative spaces, the Poisson Rouge usually requires amplification. The Armory in New York is an example of a larger alternative space. Here is an image of a performance of Gruppen uh, by Karl Heinz Stockhausen, and uh, the orchestra has been divided into four separate areas, uh, as the composer wished, uh, to create an ac acoustically immersive experience. Uh, lighting has also been coordinated to add a contextual uh, setting for this wonderful piece. The armory is also being used for the exhibition of art that can't be shown in formal museums. So how does this impact on the purpose-built uh, theaters? Here is the D. and Charles Wiley Theater in Dallas, completed in 2009 by Rem Koolhaas and Joshua Prince Ramos where the support spaces are stacked vertically so that, in fact, the theater uh, is surrounded by windows. You can see into it when the blinds are up, when there's not a performance going on, and um, people inside can see out. It's extremely flexible. Uh, time and cost saving, because of that, for, because everything is adjustable electronically, even these very long balconies. Uh, click of a mouse and they disappear. Uh, it was designed for spoken drama, but the acoustics are so remarkable that the theater actually works for everything, in, including classical music. Uh, this is the New World Center by Frank Gehry in Miami Beach uh, with this park that was created opposite the uh, building uh, f so that uh, audiences could, with no, with no fee uh, necessary, uh, hear, uh, see and hear concerts taking place uh, inside. This is called a wall cast. Uh, and it's a projection of the concert uh, taking place in the concert hall. And you can just barely make out the, the um, loudspeakers on each one of these pillars, which are part of a state-of-the-art amplification system usually referred to as electronic architecture, and that reproduces the sound uh, of the concert hall uh, in a very, very close approximation uh, to the way it would sound if you were sitting inside the hall. The interior is extraordinarily flexible also, with the stage being able to assume 14 different configurations. And very interesting, uh, you can see here two platforms, two of the four platforms uh, that are uh, on either side of the hall which allow quick changes in the type of performance taking place. So that if, for example, the large orchestra has just uh, performed a symphony, rather than wait for all the musicians to walk off the stage with their instruments, the uh, spotlight can simply shift to one of these platforms where there might be a pianist or uh, a soloist of, of some other sort uh, who can immediately uh, continue the, the concert. In Taipei, uh, this is a project, uh, you see here a scale model uh, by Rem Koolhaas uh, that is also uh, flexible. Uh, the two theaters facing each other uh, at either side here can be joined 
to make one enormous space and all three theaters, the two at either end and the theater contained in this sphere, share one backstage area that is contained in this glass cube. So not only is this design extremely cost-saving for construction, but it may also save some money in the running of the theaters. Uh, Zaha Hadid's most recent design for China, this is the city, for the city of Chang, Changsha, and uh, this one uh, complex at the end here is a performing arts, or will be a performing arts center, uh, and she has picked up the cool house idea of several theaters sharing one uh, backstage. So there's also another kind of uh, alternative space, uh, which is temporary installations. Again, Zaha Hadid, what is, was called originally the J.S. Bach Chamber Music Hall, co commissioned for a black box room uh, in the Manchester Art Gallery in 2009, uh, and then reinstalled a year later in a retired gas works in Amsterdam. Uh, although it's called, uh, uh, the name Bach appears in the title of this uh, installation, it has been used for all sorts of music. In fact, I heard uh, a concert, a piano concert, a piano recital of contemporary work uh, in Amsterdam uh, a couple of years ago. It consists of a broad white lycra ribbon over steel, uh, a steel frame, and it contains an audience of 190. This is Co-op Himmelblau in Vienna, um, the uh, firm founded by uh, Wolf Pri, uh, who calls this pavilion 21, a mobile mu mi mini opera space. Uh, it can accommodate uh, an audience of 300. Both of these temporary installation, installations recall mid-20th century, mid century spaces for music uh, that was composed especially for them. Uh, the well-known, of course, uh, Le Corbusier uh, and Yanis Zenakis Phillips Pavilion for the 19... 58 World's Fair, which was, of course, not mobile. And uh, Renzo Piano's wooden module uh, for the opera Prometheus uh, by Luigi Nono, uh, commissioned for the 1984 Venice Biennale. Uh, 400 people uh, can sit at the lowest level, and the musicians circulate uh, on the ledges uh, above them. For visual art, instead of another costly new museum wing, Diller, Scufidio, and Renfrew propose uh, what they call a seasonal inflatable structure uh, for the Hirschhorn Museum, uh, which they describe as an architecture of air. Uh, it's a pneumatic structure enclosed by a thin, translucent membrane that squeezes into the voids of the building and oozes out at the top and at the bottom. Um, it's an economic addition of 12,000 square feet uh, for audiences of 400 to 600 for public events, including uh, the performing arts. And this is a computer rendering of what the interior would look like. So what is the conclusion? Um, uncertainty uh, about funding, projections of aging and declining audiences, the preferences of a younger generation for alternatives to formal theaters, and the success of high definition broadcasts and streaming to home theater systems, home computers, and portable devices 
make me wonder about the future of these palatial new venues. For emerging audiences, informality, intensified intimacy, and a user-determined experience, bottom up rather than top down, compete in importance with the quality of acoustics. Just as industrial buildings were embraced by artists in the 1960s for display rather than museums and traditional white cube galleries, abandoned factories are one kind of building that has been successfully adapted for performances. Their large scale and absence of the kind of design Rebecca Robertson criticizes as anticipating the artistic experience allow much greater freedom in staging. I have already mentioned the armory in New York. In Europe, Bochum, in the city of Bochum, uh, in the Ruhr Valley, uh, and here you see uh, two images, the main stage uh, is over 300 feet long, four times the size of the stage at the Metropolitan Opera. These are the stage, uh, the um, shed um, uh, lights that uh, allow <clears throat> uh, daylight to penetrate. Just a few weeks ago, I saw John Cage's Euro operas one and two here, and uh, I'm convinced uh, that the production was more effective than it could have been in a traditional theater. Uh, this is Birmingham, also in an abandoned factory, uh, where uh, a couple of days after uh, Bochum, uh, I uh, visited for uh, Stockhausen's opera, Mittwoch. Uh, here is one of the musicians hanging from the raft, performing hanging from the rafters. It is also a, a very, very large space um, and is used for their music festival every year. Uh, to great effect. Another unconventional uh, space, this one outdoors, and with a rich program of visual and performing arts, is the High Line in New York, also by Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro. Here, for example, is a small arena uh, where people can sit and watch what is going on in the streets below, uh, a kind of theater of life. Addressing a centuries-old priority given to acoustics, uh, Bernard Holland of the New York Times says today's alternative spaces with their less than perfect sound are not the wrong way to hear music, just a different way with its own rewards. Thank you. Is the volume out? Okay. I just want to say that um, uh, not only is this a subject of great interest to me, but I think it's a great interest to the world in which we live. And, and I, as a, just an introduction, I just want to say that I think what's happening in the world today is that there's a new leadership equation emerging and that decisions about what happens and how we shape society and culture uh, today and in the future, decisions were made largely by corporations, they were made by governments, especially in countries in Europe and so on, uh, but now decisions are going to be made by the creative individual. And I think there's equal signs again between uh, the government making decisions about how we shape our society, the government, and now the creative individual is playing a much greater role. And I think that is the key to the future. Uh, in terms of how we're going to live better in the future. And I think the subjects that, that she's dealing with uh, is one of those, uh, uh, are examples of what really can happen when the creative community gets a voice and gets to accomplish uh, concert halls and opera houses like they are, even though there are challenges. 
uh, having to do with attendance and having to do with support and content and program and so on. But I think we're starting to see a seismic change now in the importance of the arts in the world in which we live. And I think these books are very important to that. I have some questions for her, as you can see right here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do. And again, I just want to say, uh, Victoria, I do admire what you do. Oh, thank you. And, and I think the depth of the research of what you go through to study, you go look at every building. Mm -hmm. You never write about a building you haven't seen or yeah. experienced. That's true. Uh, yeah. And the long history of doing these kind of publications are having a huge impact well, on the you. architecture, the world we live in. And uh, just one question, how did you first get involved in this exploration of cultural institutions, from museums to concert halls to opera houses? How did you first get involved in that? Well, I think my involvement with both museums and concert halls and opera houses uh, was very, very similar. Uh, in both cases, I became aware, simply by reading the popular press uh, and talking to people, that there was an explosion of buildings. I mean, in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, museums, as mm -hmm. we all know, all the new museums, all the museum editions. And uh, I, I, I came into a similar awareness uh, about five years ago uh, about uh, music venues, uh, which, by the way, I feel have replaced uh, museums as kind of destination architecture. I mean, all of these sensational buildings uh, uh, are trying to be Sydney Opera Houses. I mean, it was one of the first uh, <laughs> destination uh, buildings. And um, it's just extraordinary. Uh, I mean, uh, China is the most extreme example, but every single city has very, very often not one uh, cultural yes. center, but several, several. I mean, there are no small cities in China, but uh, still, uh, for what they consider smaller cities, there's often two enormous performing arts centers. In each city, in each city. Yeah. You, see, you told a wonderful story about you went there in 1910 to Shanghai. 1910? Uh, two th sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> uh, two th two, yeah, I hope it wasn't 1910. Uh, 2010, and you went to Shanghai, and there was a concert hall, I guess. And then when you came back in a short time afterward, there was another one that was That's completely right. that, built. That nobody had even mentioned. And I know, nobody had even mentioned nobody it. Nobody had even it mentioned it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It was like a mushroom in the rain. I mean, all of a sudden, <laughs> there was this, in, this large theater, uh, primarily for popular music, but also with some uh, opera and classical uh, performances. And, and in China, something like 50 new concert halls are being built yeah. throughout China. And they're actually getting built. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. they're actually getting built, and they're using architects from around the world, sometimes good architects, and sometimes they're getting good results, but other times not necessarily right. the best architects. I think architects. they're improving. I, I think the Chinese are very fast learners, and I think not only is the uh, level of architecture and acoustics improving, yeah. but I think they're, they're getting much more savvy about how to run these places. Yeah. Because that is the big problem worldwide, is there always seems to be enough money for bricks and mortar. Uh, but not necessarily for programming and maintenance. Yeah. Uh, and that's a disaster, because yeah. what's the point of having a building if you don't have the money to run it? It's, it's, and I think it's going to be a serious problem moving forward. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, I, uh, this is just a sidebar, but there are countries in the world that have enormous wealth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made a presentation to the leadership of a country in the Middle East and I said that what you should do is become a world patron of the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, not just uh, do what uh, you're doing within, say, the Middle East and within your country, but that you should be supporting the arts around the world and you should be encouraging them and be the first world patron of the arts. And I think these wealthy countries around the world are gonna have to take on a greater responsibility mm -hmm. to help with content. Mm -hmm. I think it's a serious, serious problem. Oh, and museums yeah, are confronting no it, concert halls and so on. Tell me what might have been one of the most moving sort of experiences you've had uh, having to do with the alchemy between architecture and music. Well, I think the most, uh, one, of the most one of the most moving experiences I had was going to a concert in the Miami Beach uh, Concert Hall, which is part of a music conservatory that uh, Michael Tilson Thomas uh, created uh, 
a number of years ago, very successfully. Uh, and my husband and I had heard uh, a concert in, during the inaugural weekend of, of the hall there. And we walked out at the end, and there was this audience of thousands of people, I mean, well over a thousand people, who had heard the concert for free. Oh. And um, they were with their children, with dogs, with, you know, <laughs> with wine that they were sipping. And it, it, was, it was very, very touching, very yeah. moving. It's an extraordinary building, isn't it? That's I right. think so, And yes. totally appropriate for Miami and, perfect, and for Michael perfect. Tilson Thomas right. and yeah. what he's trying to accomplish. Yes. Yeah. And here this collaboration between Frank Gehry the acoustician, I think, was Nagata or Toyota. It was Nagata, right. Nagata, right. and then the city and what the character of that city is. That's so right. this one works perfectly for yeah. that city. Uh, what have the the architects that we all know, the Frank Gehrys, the the Rem Cool Houses, and I want to talk to you more about Rem because mm -hmm. that's somebody I'm intrigued mm -hmm. by. Uh, but the architect Jean Nouvel, whatever it might be, architect whoever it might be, what what have they learned from their predecessors? Do you think? How does this build? We, we know there's a history. You showed the history in the beginning mm -hmm. and, and the music for Rhein and, mm -hmm. and, and Vienna and so mm -hmm. on. And then you see the new halls and uh, Hans mm -hmm. Rune to a certain period. Mm -hmm. Then we see Frank Gehry and so on, Disney Hall mm -hmm. and so forth. What, what's been learned by the predecessors well, uh, I, to I, people I, like I, Frank Gehry and I, so I on? I hope. I mean, I think uh, I see in what I consider the, the most interesting interiors uh, a an acknowledgement of what is needed, good acoustics, good sight lines, and so on and so forth, but also a need to get away from what has taken place in the past. Uh, and uh, that, that's what I was in, uh, alluding to when, when I started to talk this, this afternoon, uh, that this, this kind of frozen uh, quality of the concert hall and the opera house, I think that times have changed. And uh, I think all musicians uh, agree that the Musikverein, which has always been the model of perfect acoustics, is perfect for only some music. Uh, for example, contemporary music doesn't sound so great there. I've mm -hmm. heard contemporary music in the Musikverein, and it, and, and it is not uh, excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. The acoustics are not uh, geared for that. So I think what the smartest architects uh, in this respect have learned is that they have to accommodate a number of different kinds of music and that we're just not going to live, we're not going to stay uh, uh, immersed in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. You know, the, we know what Frank Gehry has accomplished uh, and you mentioned in your book that uh, the Disney Hall in two, 2003 when it opened actually changed uh, or, or was the turning point looking mm -hmm. into the pre into mm -hmm. the future? Mm -hmm. Why did you say that? Well, first of all, he adapted the um, the vineyard, uh, which yeah. is this uh, arena type arrangement, this theater in the in the round arrangement, to what is basically a shoebox. Uh, again, he was working with this very brilliant acoustician, Toyota from Nagata Acoustics, and. Uh, uh, Toyota was very, very adamant that <clears throat> for a hall that big, there had to be a basic rectangular space. But then within that, uh, Gary, uh, who I think is a kind of architectural genius, uh, was able to arrange the seating so that it, it, it really uh, approximated uh, this uh, vineyard kind of seating. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I think, you know, I think that was a big turning point for, for a hall that big. And I think the friendliness of it, I mean, one characteristic of the new halls is their transparency, the fact that you can see into the lobbies, that they're open, there isn't this uh, whole thing of hiding a culture, you know, like a mysterious uh, presence to be revered. There's mm -hmm. an openness where you're gonna share uh, all aspects of what's going on in a building. Mm -hmm. Rem Kulos is another one who I'm mm -hmm. quite interested in. And, and all the, of all the architects working today, his exploratory instincts and how he approaches a project, whether it's a concert hall, whether mm -hmm. it's a theater. Mm -hmm. And I've seen Oporto and I've seen the one in Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, and this architect has probably been, like Frank Gehry, one of the more influential 
with regard to new projects that are going to be built in the future. Yeah, well, you can see Hadid already picked yes, up exactly. his idea. Of <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. And they studied, actually, at the at, right. in London right. together. Yes. And they are good friends. What is there about Rem Koolhaas and what he does and how he goes about approaching a problem based on your research that brings out these highly innovative, future-looking projects? Well, I mean, he's a, he's a brilliant man. Uh, he said something to me once which, uh, which stayed with me. I mean, here is a man who has designed uh, a number of performance spaces uh, very successfully. And yet he said to me, the best uh, way to, to perform music or theater or whatever, just the way the best way to show art is not in a formal concert hall mm -hmm or a formal museum. Yes. So, I mean, he always is play, he's always questioning, even yes. his own work. Yeah. It's, it's when we took the tour for Disney Hall, we went to all the likely suspects. And we went to Boston, and you've done the same thing. We went to Amsterdam, mm -hmm. we went to Leipzig, mm -hmm. uh, we went to Suntory Hall in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And we learned a certain amount from each of those. Uh, and then we went through the process, and we chose Frank Gehry as the architect. But there seems to be, with the new projects, with Disney Hall, with what Rem Kulas is doing, mm. a big leap forward. I think so. And, and mm. what is that leap forward? What is, you mentioned some of the things, intimacy mm -hmm. and so on. But I, I, intimacy, flexibility is flexibility. Ter terribly important. To get away yeah. from this onus that Rebecca Robertson refers to, where, I mean, if you walk into Carnegie Hall, you expect a certain kind of performance because it is a hall that is an older hall and that was designed for a certain kind of performance. And you don't expect something that is going to uh, uh, innovate, that is going to be different in, uh, in, a, in a radical way uh, from what ha has been performed there for many generations. Yeah. It's, it's quite interesting, actually, how it is changing. Where do you see the future? If I say oh. to you, look out five <laughs> years, look out 10 years, look out 15 years, what do you think we're going to say five years from now, 10 years from now, and say 15 years from now? Well, my, about, my, this is a golden age, as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. My greatest hope for the future is that ticket prices can come, come down. Yes. Because I yes, think yes. that that is a terrible yes. handicap. Yes. Uh, and so I don't know what the solution is, yeah. but I think that's really essential. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of architecture, uh, I mean, I think that these cost saving uh, de uh, uh, devices like the Cool House uh, with three theaters sharing one backstage, mm -hmm. I think is brilliant mm -hmm. and might even bring down the cost of tickets yes. uh, uh, because if one can save uh, money in construction, one can perhaps also save money in, uh, in, running, mm -hmm. uh, in running those theaters. So uh, I think just a continuation of some of the new developments, flexibility, mm -hmm. uh, intimacy, uh, transparency, mm -hmm. uh, all of those. We, we have a building in Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, I thought we would um, try to be a bit maybe more pro provocative, maybe, but it's called the Kennedy Center. Well, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, two small notes. Can you, okay. can you say some things about scale, which I think will, will then uh, go along with you and with the urban place. And the second thing, you didn't talk at all about materials, and especially when I saw the Zaha did a kind of a space, interior space that was a fluent. A, what material was that? And a, say something, because you were just mentioning the five newest as failures to some, or having some, a, growing pain, and can you just touch on the reasons? Like well, the reason for the growing pains is um, there's no money for uh, programming. I mean, the Chinese government it just does not give any money for programming, or has not. I think that's beginning to change very slowly. I think your question about scale is excellent, uh, and I'm sorry that I didn't point out that most of the new uh, music venues are much smaller uh, than in the past. I mean, I don't think anybody would try to build a metropolitan opera with 4,000 seats today. Uh, there is a trend uh, to, uh, 
to, and this, this buzzword that I refer to, intimacy, uh, people just don't want to be in one of these enormous uh, spaces. I did mention glass as one of the many materials that has been improved now and experimented with so that it can be used for acoustical spaces with, uh, with, with some success. And there are many other materials. And you're quite right, you spotted the uh, Zaha Hadid interior in Guangzhou. And that is a kind of uh, material that is continuous. There are no seams. Uh, I don't know the technical name for it, but uh, it makes for this very, very continuous, streamlined feeling, which is very attractive. I'll tell you a little story about Disney Hall and materials. Uh, when we were work when the design was being developed, uh, somebody who was a major, major donor came to me and said, Richard, uh, such and such a major donor wants the interior of the hall to be mahogany. And, and Victoria will know what that means mm -hmm. when I told Frank Gehry that this donor would love to have the interior of the hall be mahogany. And Frank Gehry went through, as Victoria knows Frank Gehry well, he said, the project's over, Disney Hall will never get built, it's not going to be mahogany. He went through the whole thing, right? And when it, so he said, get us out of this, right? So we thought for a while, and we went back to the donor, and we said, uh, you can have mahogany. You can have mahogany in the, in, in, the, in the hall of Disney Hall. But I just have to tell you one thing. It's coming from the rainforest, and you don't want that on your shoulders. And this person, the major donor, who was very involved in the city, said, oh, oh, no, I don't think so. Let Frank Gehry decide what material it should be, and that's why it's Douglas Fir. But th they were insisting on mahogany. But there's a lot of stories about how these buildings get built, and, and, and it's a miracle. I think it's a miracle. We know she mentioned the cathedral. She mentioned uh, the uh, Garnier uh, Concert Hall in Paris and how long it took to build. Uh, and Disney Hall took 18 years to build, by the way. But it's, I think there are certain buildings that are destined to get built because of the greatness of what they are. And I think she mentioned many of those buildings that because of their greatness, no matter what the obstacles are, they are, they are destined to be built. And I don't mm -hmm. know how you feel about that. Yeah, no, that's but true. They're going, the cathedrals, whatever it is, they're going to get built, yeah. I think. Yeah, they're I think, I think so, yeah. People are going to die. There's going to be blood on the floor. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be not easy, and it's going to take more time than we thought. But it does get done, and Disney Hall is one of those. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned many, many examples mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of these projects and what it takes to get them built is heroic yep. on the part of the yes. architect. Himself. Richard, you said you had one more question for Victoria. Was that yes, it? Yes, I do. I, oh, do. Okay. I do. I do. I have to ask her this one question. Okay. We're in the middle of election. I've yeah. noticed. I've yes, noticed. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I, <laughs> I know an institution that's looking for a new chairman, maybe. And, and the person came to me and said, well, we, we, we need a new chairman. Who should be and how should we do the search? And I said, just wait a short period of time. And I said, if Obama wins, then the new chairman's Romney. If Romney wins, the new chairman of the board of this arts institution can be Obama. And you'd solve all your problems. They've been vetted. They've been, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. But do you want to you predict who's going to be the next president? Oh, of the no, States? no, no. I wouldn't dare do that. <laughs> I knew she would answer that question. I knew she would answer that question. Now you know why we adore this individual, why we admire her greatly. Mm -hmm why we respect her, and I can't wait for the next book. Thank you, Richard. Thank, right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Join me in Thank applause you. for both of our speakers. Thank you. Rich, Rich. Richard and Victoria, thank you for a fascinating conversation and for the ideas have been flying. Uh, if you would, we are going to close now, but there are books for sale and signing on the way out, if you would like, and Victoria will sign them right at the table. And I want to thank you once again for joining us for a very productive and interesting continuation of the partnership between the Library of Congress and the Hirshhorn. Let's one more round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.